the damnation of ignorance. Here I continue reading in Hell from the 1st of the 20th century by Hypatia Bradler Bonner, 1913. This is part two of chapter three, titled The Damnation of Infants. This was held to be the logical consequence of the doctrine set forth by Paul in Romans 5, verse 12, that through Adam's fall a burden of sin rested upon all men, dooming them without exception to eternal punishment. They could escape this dire decree only through baptism. St. Augustine, 4th century, taught that baptism was necessary to free the soul from the power which the devil had over it on account of Adam's sin, and that without baptism all were doomed to hell. He admitted that the crying of a baby is not sinful, and therefore does not deserve eternal damnation. In the Pelagian controversy, Julian the Pelagian objected that if the doctrine of original sin were true, it were a cruel and wicked thing to beget children who would be born in a state of condemnation. To this, St. Augustine replied that God is the author of being to all men, many of whom will be eternally condemned, yet God is not to be accused of cruelty for creating them. He suggests that unbaptized infants who have only original sin and are not loaded with sins of their own may suffer a gentler condemnation than the personally guilty. Elsewhere in the same controversy he takes a less merciful view, saying, I have explained to you what is the kingdom and what everlasting fire, so that when you confess the infant will not be in the kingdom, you must acknowledge he will be in everlasting fire. St. Fulgentius of the 6th century, in his treatise Defied, writes, Be assured, and doubt not, that not only men who have obtained the use of their reason, but also little children who have begun to live in their mother's womb, and have there died, or who having been just born, have passed away from the world without the sacrament of holy baptism, administered in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, must be punished by the eternal torture of undying fire. For although they have committed no sin by their own will, they have nevertheless drawn with them the condemnation of original sin by their carnal conception and nativity. Pope Gregory, in the 7th century, declared that those taken from their present life and not having the sacrament of salvation for their deliverance from original sin, though they have done nothing of their own here, yet there they undergo eternal torments. It is related in the vision of Alberico, 1123, that when he, a boy of ten, made a visit to purgatory, personally conducted by St. Peter and two angels, he was startled to see one-year-old babes boiling in fiery vapours. St. Peter thereupon explained to him that even a child a day old is not without sin, for in stretching out his arm to his mother he may strike her on the face. One sect, known as the Hierasites, taught that no infant dying before the use of reason could possibly come to the kingdom of heaven. They held that marriage and begetting children was unlawful under the New Testament, and no married persons could inherit the kingdom of God. The belief in the damnation of unbaptized infants was generally held during the first eleven centuries of the Christian era, but by degrees there grew up some abatement in the rigour which would consign helpless infants to eternal torment, and in the twelfth century a distinction was made between the punishment of original sin and actual sin. For original sin the penalty was deprivation of the sight of God, for actual sin the torments of everlasting hell. This led to the invention of a limbus infantium, or parvalorum, or infernus purorum, where unbaptized infants suffer no other torment than loss of heaven. Henceforward, to assert the contrary was esteemed a heresy, and this doctrine of a limbus infantium is still held by the Catholic Church. 
The doctrine of the damnation of infants was by no means confined to the Roman Catholics. Wycliffe, 1324-84, finds it hard to positively assert that the unbaptized infants of believers will be damned, but he says, God, if he will, may damn such an infant and do him no wrong, and if he will, he can save him. I know that whatever God does in it will be just and a work of mercy to be praised of all the faithful. If infants are damned, then he believes they will suffer not only loss of heaven, but sensible punishment. The Hussites of Bohemia hoped that infants dying unbaptized might be saved by the mercy of God in accepting their parents' faithful desire of baptizing for the deed. This hope of mercy for the innocent was denounced as a heresy and formed part of the accusations against Huss. Upon the Reformation, Protestants generally held that the punishment of original sin is, in strictness, damnation in hell. Luther and his followers lay so much stress upon the necessity of the purge of baptism as to permit a layman to do it in case of emergency, rather than that the infant should die without. Calvin and his adherents went a little further, and taught that unbaptized infants might be saved, provided the miss of baptism happened by no contumacy or neglect of the parents. From time to time, protests have been raised against this fiendish doctrine of the eternal damnation of helpless infants. Zwingli was violently attacked because he ventured to exclude Christian infants from the penalty of original sin. A protest written by Antonius Cornelius and published by Weschel in 1531 aroused the anger of a Catholic priest, Father Garas, to such an extent that he denounced Cornelius in elegant language as an abortion of hell, and rejoicingly tells how by divine judgment the publisher Weschel was reduced to poverty in consequence of having published this book. In 1690, a Quaker named George Keith objected not only to the damnation of infants, but to that of heretics also, and was formally repudiated for his humanity by the ministers of the gospel in Boston. These ministers issued a book, the preface of which is signed by four names, James Allen, Joshua Moody, Samuel Willard, and Cotton Mather in which they maintained the principles of the Protestant religion against Keith's calumnies. Taking it all together, there has been small tenderness or pity shown for the little ones by those who believed in hell. Catholic and Calvinist have made infants' damnation an integral part of their faith. The Puritans were, if possible, more extreme than the Catholics. Learn, wrote that awful Puritan priest Christopher Love, that little children and young infants, though they live but for a day, are in as great danger as men that live a hundred years. People in their blind conceit, he went on, call a child innocent, yet though they live but a minute in this world, God may justly punish them for the sin of their nature. The Bishop of Toronto, in the middle of last century, published a declaration that every child of humanity, except the Virgin Mary, is from the first moment of conception a child of wrath, hated by the blessed Trinity, belonging to Satan, and doomed to hell. While the Reverend Dr. Nehemiah Adams, a congregational preacher of Boston, contemporary with the bishop, had no hesitation in suggesting that the forty-two children that mocked Elisha are now in hell for calling Elisha baldhead. The children are first devoured by she-bears and then consigned to everlasting torment. Dr. Nathaniel Emmons, pastor of Franklin Church, Massachusetts, in a long sermon on the depravity of children, contended that little children are moral agents before they are capable of uttering a single word. Hence, they are capable of sinning. They are, for example, capable of selfishness. In support of his contention, he quotes, Thou wast a transgressor from the womb. Some divines have argued there is no salvation without faith, but infants cannot believe, therefore they cannot be saved. 
They are incapable of evil, therefore they cannot be damned. Hence annihilation is the only future possible. But what are we to think of this? Reprobate infants are vipers of vengeance, which Jehovah will hold over hell with the tongs of wrath, till they writhe up and cast their venom in his face. The Church of England forbids the ordinary office of burial to be used for an unbaptized infant, and within the recollection of the present generation it was customary in some rural districts at least to bury such children by night in a waste corner of the churchyard. This kindly Christian doctrine of the damnation of unbaptized children gave rise in the Middle Ages to all sorts of legends. The ignis fatui, so often seen hovering about marshy or misty places, which science teaches the rationalists are nothing more extraordinary than exhalations of marsh gas, our superstitious forefathers imagined were the souls of unbaptized children, endeavouring to guide themselves to the nearest water. In some districts there were legends of a spectral pack of hellhounds, the souls of unbaptized children who could not rest, but roamed and moaned and shrieked through the woods all night. There is also the myth of the pitiful robin, whose little breast became burned and red through carrying drops of water in its bill to hell to relieve the suffering children there. In the border counties of England and in north-east Scotland, the belief long prevailed that the souls of little children who died unbaptized wandered about in the air, restless and unhappy, until judgment day. In Northumberland it was customary to bury an unbaptized babe at the feet of an adult Christian corpse. In Ireland in the sixteenth century the right arms of male children were left unchristened in order that they might be able to give a more deadly blow. In the islands of Greece the peasantry still believe that stillborn children or children who die unbaptized are in danger of becoming werewolves and vampires. That's the end of chapter 3. Thanks for listening.